Welcome. Thanks for coming on this dark and stormy night. I'm David Levi Strauss. I'm the chair of the graduate program in art criticism and writing here at SVA. I wanted to um, uh, let you know about a couple of things that are happening. The, the program is having its second open house and information session next week on Saturday, November 22nd from 2 to 4 in our place over on 24, 21st Street. So if you or someone you know is curious about the program, please um, send them over there on Saturday. I also want to let you all know that WJT Mitchell will be here Thursday, December 11th to talk about Jacques Ranciere's book, The Future of the Image. Carol Becker is a writer, cultural critic, and professor of the arts and dean of the School of the Arts at Columbia University. She's come back to New York, uh, having grown up in Brooklyn after many years at the Chicago Art Institute. She's the author of The Invisible Drama, Women and the Anxiety of Change, Zones of Contention, Essays on Art Institutions and Anxiety, Surpassing the Spectacle, Global Transformations and the tr Changing Politics of Art, and a forthcoming collection of essays Thinking in Place, Art, Action, and Cultural Production. In his foreword to Zones of Contention, Henry Giroux wrote, for Becker, understanding the complexity of the art process and its relationship with multiple publics is a pedagogical process that deepens our understanding of how industries are formed, artwork produced, and responsibilities engaged so as to enable the possibilities of democratic public life and of surpassing the spectacle. The most recent book Michael Brenson wrote, in this passionate and fiercely engaged book, Carol Becker makes the case that without the ability of artists to speak the unspeakable and find form for the invisible, this country has no chance to resist the infantilizing seductiveness of spectacle and realize the radical potential of, of freedom. Tonight she'll speak on what we do, values implicit in schools of art and design. Please welcome Carol Becker. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me. It's been a long time since I've been at SVA, and I was really tempted to buy a sweatshirt, I have to say. They, I really like the store and everything, um, but I, I don't think I could go back to Columbia wearing that. It wouldn't, I don't think it would go over that well. Um, I want to say something about this piece. It's a, it's a piece that's in my new book. Um, my book exists, physically exists. Um, not in the stores yet, but actually exists. And that's always thrilling and exciting and scary. But I, um, I, I wrote just these two paragraphs because I sort of, um, well, I'll read to you. The intention of this piece is very simple. It's an attempt to deconstruct what we in the world of educating artists and designers, and we who are the recipients of this education might agree are the fundamentals or the underlying values embedded in what we do or what we are trying to do. Can you hear me okay? Sound okay? I gave this piece a different name and a different beginning for my new book to locate it within the context of the book's discussion about place. I also didn't want the essay to seem too inside, you know, by giving it what we do, assuming we, every reader, was an art school person. Um, inside a particular worldview that would have excluded others. So I wrote a few beginning paragraphs to serve as a bridge, but for all of you, I'm just gonna jump into the piece because we all do, we are involved together in a process. And I also wanna note that the world has just really changed very radically, uh, miraculously really last week. So something uh, many had been hoping for and working for for a very long time, but this huge change will affect the psychic state of many things including pedagogy and the thinking about the place of art and thought itself in, the, in US society. So were I writing this essay now, I might frame it somewhat differently and talk about utopian thinking or what I hope will be a kind of return to thinking about utopia in a democracy. But when I wrote it, it was really a very much more cautious moment 
and I was afraid to appear too romantic or too optimistic, which I'm often accused of. So perhaps we could talk about this later, I thought, maybe in the questions like, what might this moment mean, really, for the production of culture? So I'd like to give you this Ken Cleaning quote to, be, to quote to begin. What we call art is not only that which culminates in great works, but rather a space where society carries out its visual production. So that's a bigger sense of art in the way I think about it. Okay, so I'm gonna read this to you so you should get, get comfortable. They're pictures, images, <laughs> won't be, I hope it won't be boring. Okay, what do practitioners of art design, architecture, as well as art educators, art therapists, art and design historians, curators, and visual and critical studies scholars, those who comprise the faculty, students, and administrators of these environments all have in common. I would suggest two things. The first is visual sophistication, a way of seeing that is very developed, and two, a way of working that to others might not seem like work at all. Such practitioners live in the world of ideas and in the manifestation of these ideas into visual form. So you can see I'm really stripping this really down, like what is it actually that we do? One could argue that those engaged in advertising, for example, are also extremely savvy about the visual, using their skills to seduce potential customers. But while practitioners of art and design also attempt to seduce viewers through visual forms, there is often, although not always, a difference in intention between these forms of production and delivery. Implicit and explicit in the education of artists and designers is an emphasis on using one's visual skills to further consciousness, to make oneself and one's audience more astute, and to help one's environment become more functional and inspiring. Of course, many artists and designers do not function with these values in the foreground, but the educational process out of which they have emerged, if it was a true academic environment and not commercially focused, was probably founded on values more humane than simply wanting to lull people into spending more money. Fixating on false needs, feeding destructive impulses, or developing an obliviousness to the social reality. Those educating artists and designers, on the contrary, often hope to instill in their students a desire to create unique spaces within which the visual can help all of us to recognize our deepest emotions, ask difficult questions, see reality stripped of illusion, and then gain the courage to confront this reality when necessary. Really good art and design should also allow us to understand that the imagination, when given space within which to expand, is able to experience its own nature as infinite. However, the desire for material or financial success may ultimately thwart these lofty goals. These values make up the foundation upon which most schools of art and design and architecture are built. And this is where the education of the practitioners of these disciplines often begins. So this section is called Play and Process. Fundamentals to such creative environments is the belief in and commitment to process. How one gets from the beginning of an idea to its visual expression. Artists, designers, architects, and all who grapple with the development of ideas into form have a fundamental faith that if they give themselves over entirely to the process of creating, then an object, event, or environment will emerge. How one creates and develops ideas is a very subtle, alchemical, impalpable endeavor, and like thinking itself, is a difficult one to describe. This solitary activity of allowing ideas to manifest as they choose needs to be nurtured and protected if one is to succeed in the arts. Almost nowhere else in the world of work is process and the state of mind that enables it so valued for itself as a useful activity that needs no other justification. Creative people assume that like the practices of meditation or thinking, the concentrated open-endedness of following the process of thought will lead to knowledge. For artists, the process of thinking through, or the making of a form of, is, oh, I can't read what I wrote here. Through, <laughs> I'll skip that. And although process may at first seem like an inefficient, indulgent, or impractical methodology to foster, 
it is the only way to create the space-time module within which an unfettered imagination can experiment joyfully. Play is inextricably linked to process, but for most adults is perceived as abandonment of one's responsibilities, or at least a break from them. But for artists and designers, play is understood as serious work. Play is what the gods do. It is what mortals, or at least grown mortals, rarely are allowed to engage, and yet it is fundamental to creation. Play is the ability to abandon a sense of utility, to get lost in the present, to allow the imagination to roam freely, and to be taken, simply, to pay, be taken along its path without stopping to ask the importance, meaning, or usefulness of the journey. In, an art make, in, in art making, it can necessitate the willingness to break rules, trample conventions, and simply allow the whimsy of an idea to float because it seems exciting and brings pleasure. In nature, play can appear as excess and can manifest as extravagance or as the unexpected. Why, for example, are there so many kinds of birds, so many colors, so much diversity? Biologists have speculated that one could understand this abundance of form as a type of play. A sense of play governs artists' focus on process, but it also can animate the finished work. Works of art thrive when they communicate a sense of play, but it is not easy to play as a grown-up. Picasso understood this very well. People would often look at his drawings and comment, oh, my child could do that, to which the artist would respond, perhaps, but you can't. Children give themselves over to their imaginations with abandon, but most adults have lost this ability, having become too self-conscious to be truly spontaneous. Artists and designers who capture the collective imagination for a time are often those who are most playful. Part of the radicality of the design for Frank Gehry's Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, Spain, is its use of materials. Titanium creates a luminous and unexpected surface for the structure that is particularly seductive because it sparkles and reflects. Such shininess in the midst of the gray bass city makes the building feel playful. The museum is breathtaking in its form and its placement at the end of the street of traditional buildings and on the water which shimmers with intriguing images. It also is an excellent example of what is now possible as a result of computer design. When it was first built, it seemed as if it were the very first building of the 21st century, precisely because it was so astoundingly irreverent of the expectations of its historical location, and yet it works. I just saw the model, I was in Abu Dhabi, and I saw the model for the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi that makes this look very old-fashioned, <laughs> but I still think this is much more elegant. Good architecture should empower and enliven us to imagine the future and make our work and lives more pleasurable, functional, safe, and aesthetically engaging. It should encourage us to take risks, change the culture, culture of existing taste, but also engage us in serious types of play. Most buildings do not do any of this, so when one does, it becomes a real source of attraction. Perhaps the inclusion of Jeff Koons' puppy at the museum's entrance should be read as a fundamental statement about the connection between this building and the notion of play. Why else have an enormous puppy made of geranium standing guard at the front door? In the mythology of art making, those outside the process often perpetuate a belief that artists only play. See, sensing the free form nature of the creative process as quite a departure from most structured work. And artists themselves often feel conflicted and even guilty when they take pleasure in the freedom of what they do. But artists know that creative work of this kind is a serious endeavor and is often terrifying as they face self-doubt and possible critical repudiation. Artists like others whose work requires the task of public, the risk of public humiliation live in this anxiety much of the time. When one is working with young artists and designers, part of the challenge is to help direct them through their own difficult moments in the creative process, when for whatever reasons they get stuck fixating on a sense of inadequacy. This ab their ability to navigate the turmoil and an uncertainty of the creative psyche could be the most important skill they learn from their professors. These educators try to communicate that all creative people experience 
such moments and that the ability to suspend judgment on oneself and one's work while following ideas as they evolve is the only way through these treacherous vortices. And even as teachers are reassuring their students, encouraging them to break through these internal resistances, they themselves often face similar fears of failure once alone in their studios. No one working creatively is exempt from such moments. But because they too are in the creative process, professional artists and designers often can help those just starting out. Another way past creative fears and the barriers to creativity, they present an artist's inherent passionate and fundamental need to keep working. For people in most societies, the motivation to work is imposed from the outside through necessity and then through the demands of a job. These structures keep them locked into work as conventions have determined. But artists most often generate their own jobs and projects, whether employed to do so or not, and therefore must be driven and propelled from the inside. Through the process of work, they are able to break through their own resistances. Artists' inner motivation is something that an educational environment needs to help students learn to cultivate and negotiate, since it is essential for the successful production of work. Often such motivation is connected to obsession, the almost unnatural focus that keeps someone returning again and again to the same area of study, the same acts of engagement, until the energy for the project dissipates or transforms with the constant repetition and final completion of a body of work. Faculty members at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, where I was a professor and also dean for many years, often take groups of students, artists, designers, architects, and writers on study trips abroad. When I first led a trip to Southeast Asia, we visited Angkor Wat in Cambodia. This site is comprised of miles and miles of ancient buildings and temples whose facades have been carved over centuries with the stories of Buddhist classics, such as the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. Here, a printmaking student spent almost an entire week at one temple working on rubbings and drawings of a very small section of a corner of one of the wall's iconography. She had become obsessed and had narrowed the scope of the unmanageable scale of the compound into something she could effectively recreate in drawing. In January 2006, on our globalized city study trip to Bangkok, Hanoi, and Luang Prabang, another student became intensely interested in the color of gold in Bangkok and in the 60 local Buddhist temples in Luang Prabang and Laos. He spent his entire time in Luang Prabang, the former spiritual capital, photographing gold ornamentation, gold leaf painting and ornament and, ornament, and gold sprayed stencils. For 10 days, he, rode with, he rose with the sun and the chanting of the monks and, work until, and worked until the sun had set. Each student, artist, designer, art historian, visual and critical studies scholar, arts administrator, art educator, undergraduate and graduate student had accumulated at least 1,000 images before we returned to the United States. And some had made video and sound recordings as well. Such are the passions of artists and designers. Once something grabs them, it doesn't let them go. A high level of concentration and unrelenting obsession with detail while trusting intuition and giving oneself over to the process of making are some of the qualities that young artists and designers need to learn to navigate. These are also positive attributes that they can offer the world. By contrast, most of contemporary society tends to move too quickly, give up too easily, become distracted, desperately seek the new, and tread either too harshly or too lightly on the old to really see the obvious and the extraordinary in the ordinary and to locate themselves and their activities in the everyday present. The qualities creative people demonstrate may seem impractical in their non-utilitarian excess, but are the most practical and potentially liberating of all if one is to achieve a creative life, accomplish meaningful work, and help to encourage the evolution of a sane society which can only come into being if it is imagined. Jean-Paul Sartre wrote, he who begins with facts will never arrive at essences. Perhaps we can say that those who pursue a subject with passion, with the heart as well as the mind, and with the spirit of play always intact, will more likely come to grasp it at its core than those who rely on information, quantification, or objectification. To transform society one has to throw oneself 
into the experience of it in all its dimensionality. Otherwise, its complexity will remain elusive. Schools of art and design not only work to create environments that allow for and encourage such focused effort, but they also try to teach students how to create such environments for themselves once they leave, set up their own studios and disciplined work schedules. Instructors, for example, rather than overemphasizing tangible results, the actual thing created focus students' attention on the mode of experimentation, the conditions within which one is able to work. The questions asked, the methodologies employed, the state of mind achieved. This type of thought is often activated through critiques of student work that are intended to help move the work and the artist forward. Such environments also encourage a definition of success that signifies an, effect, an effective manifestation of ideas into exciting forms. A definition not based on fashion or marketability, but on whether the piece works in terms of its own integrity and the artist's or designer's intent. In the larger society, value is generally not ascribed to one's progress on a creative path. The courage demonstrated on the journey, the level of knowledge gained along the way, or the innovations expressed. Rather, value is primarily attributed to the outcome, the product, about which the world asks questions such as, is it useful? What is its monetary value? Who will respond to it? It is therefore often difficult to explain to those outside creative circles how something that has not as yet accrued value in the global economy and that may never receive a notable reception, i.e. has not yet been deemed useful, could ever be understood as successful. It is also not easy to explain how embracing failure is actually essential to all unique achievements and should not be feared any more than the accidental or the unexpected, all of which might turn everything around and open up possibilities not recognized or understood at the outset of a project. Students often come to schools of art and design having previously been in situations where they were deemed the most talented artist. At art school, they find themselves surrounded by others whom they quickly recognize are as, at least as gifted this situation can create anxiety. Some young artists and designers respond by trying to impress their peers by sticking to the type of work that previously brought them success. But in the art school environment, the pedagogical approach is to encourage the opposite, unlearn all that came before, start now, and don't be afraid to fail. Communities of artists, designers, thinkers, and educators understand the value of trial and error, the need to fail, and that what at first appears to be an inconsequential element, an addendum of thought, might prove to be the most important discovery of the entire endeavor. In short, they recognize the value of a playful, boundaryless, free-form process. A designed object using robotics or electronics might not have achieved the imagined purpose, but it could take its inventor much closer to understanding how how such technol technologies might be effective. Or the technique embodied in a useless sculpture may prove to be a practical design component for a future commercial application. The World Wide Web, for example, was originally conceived by high-tech types as a communication tool to be in touch with each other. No one initially imagined the extent of its potential. A painting that does not work visually, as artists say, could still be the most successful manifestation of an idea the artist has accomplished to date. Learning to make it work is part of the creative process and a large element of what needs to be learned before an artist or designer can become a mature practitioner. The US market economy prides itself on risk and innovation, so one cannot say that it is risk averse, but it is failure averse. In the United States, we tend to admire and romanticize the spirit of adventure only when it leads to measurable success. But those breaking ground in any field of human endeavor know that without recognition and acceptance of the value of failure, there really can be no true risk taking. And without risk taking, there can be no innovation. In addition, one cannot live honestly as a human being and as a citizen of society, open and with a courageous heart and mind if one is not able to admit when one has failed, either when it has led to greater knowledge 
or when it has caused pain. At a societal level, the fear of failure is apparent in US society. One need only look at the history of the US response to Vietnam and the American war, as the Vietnamese call it, as an example. The US clearly lost that war, but this fact is never spoken in mainstream US media. It is as if the admission of loss might create a stigma from which the country could never recover, or the collective ego would simply crumble under the weight of this historical truth. The result of this failure to recognize, of recognition, is that the society, not having recovered from Vietnam, has repeated its mistakes. For example, it became very difficult to speak the truth about why the United States began the war in Iraq. After the deaths of thousands of US soldiers and hundreds of thousands of civilians in Iraq, it is very difficult for the collective to accept the idea that all these people might have died in vain in a war whose origins were based on deception and manipulation. And so long as the truth is not spoken, the reality is still not confronted. The societal consciousness cannot truly feel the magnitude of what has occurred or move on to the next level of understanding. Accepting failure at a personal or societal level allows us to create different situations out of which we might better actualize our intent. These understandings emerge through process, through the space allowed for transformation and evolution, for the experimentation and criticality that while leading us to admit failure might just take us where we want to go. Temporalities part one. Those who live in the world of art and design recognize that the most interesting ideas and work of a particular time often cannot be recognized as such in that time by lay people and even by the art world itself. This is an important point for young artists to understand. They need to learn to trust their own ability to evaluate the quality of their work and that of others in spite of the public's reception of the work. People educated to look differently with, different, with great discernment may see value where those with a less cultured and visual sense cannot. Over time, a large group also may come to recognize the merit of something as the general level of society's visual sophistication increases and the ideas behind the work at one time considered radical or even simply bad become safely absorbed into the collective consciousness. We have witnessed this phenomenon repeatedly throughout the history of art design and the making of culture. When studying art history, it is surprising to learn that Impressionism, the most mainstream, uplifting, sensual genre of painting, now broadly co-opted by advertising, was once considered so scandalous that pregnant women were advised not to look at these paintings, lest they cause them to abort. <laughs> Even Van Gogh, whose magnificent paintings are now reproduced all over the world, sold only one while he was alive, this one, Red Vineyard at Arles. And we know that he died penniless and forlorn. To recount this story is not to romanticize the inevitability of the artist as poor and starving in body and spirit, but rather to emphasize that in the case of Van Gogh, the problem was never that the work was not interesting enough, but rather that the work was perhaps too interesting when it was made to be recognized as such. In another example, Louis Kahn, one of the truly great architects of the 20th century, died in debt and alone in Grand Central Station in New York. Yet people now understand what an excellent designer he was and travel from all over the world to see the Salk Institute in La Jolla or the Kimball Art Museum in Fort Worth, Texas, buildings now deemed by many as perfect in both sighting and form. This is a little clip, if it works, from my architect. It's just so you can see this building, it's so fabulous.
There is something spiritual about this space. It would benefit artists and designers to take the time to reflect on the meaning of these stories in relationship to individual lives and to their own practice. These true stories tell us repeatedly that success, as it has been defined in the art and design worlds for at least the last two centuries, isn't always the true measure of what is actually well done and important in the development of ideas. Rather, it is often an indication of what people are able to accept and understand at the time. Work that has been substantially ahead of its time and ahead of the context within which it was produced, presented, years, even decades later, may eventually be recognized for its innovation and even regarded as a classic. Originality and brilliance are historical and contextual constructs. The market value of artwork translated for the artist as fame and riches is often only attributed over time, long after the life of their creators has ended. Some works initially fail only because they are not positioned within a receptive context or for the right audience or because they are presented in an inauspicious moment. Waiting for Godot was a flop when it opened for its first American production in Coconut Grove, Miami in January 1956, starring Burt Lahr, who played the cowardly lion in The Wizard of Oz. It was mistakenly billed as a raucous comedy, which set up a false expectation with a mainstream audience. The Miami production closed quickly, produced some months later in April 1956 for a more sophisticated New York audience who had already heard about the play's success in Europe. It was a tremendous success. And when performance theorist Herbert Blau, then teaching in San Quentin prison, staged the play there in 1957, it was so well received by evidence of the 1,400 inmates that it helped spawn the first prison drama society. In 2007, contemporary artist Paul Chan restaged Waiting for Godot in New Orleans with Creative Times in various locations outside in the Lower Ninth Ward and in Gentilly, recontextualizing the play in relationship to the desperation people have felt since the aftermath of Katrina, and thousands of people came to witness the performance. Artists and those who curate them often have their hand on the pulse of the collective psyche. In recognizing changes occurring in society before others do, they have to maintain the confidence to trust their instincts and not bow to what is considered acceptable. In a now famous incident, Marsha Tucker, founder of the New Museum, who died in 2006, curated a show of Richard Tuttle's work for the Whitney Museum in 1976 when she was employed as the curator of painting and sculpture. The show's reception was very negative. Most critics were simply unable to see the value of this quiet, small-scale work at all, perhaps because it was shown on the heels of abstract expressionism and its grandiosity of scale, with its grandiosity of scale and aspiration. Tucker was asked to leave the Whitney, and the next day she went on to found the new museum. Tuttle is now considered a major figure in contemporary art, and the new museum has secured, as you know, its wonderful new place for the future in lower Manhattan. Those who produce new works and those who choose to show them must be simultaneously very permeable available, accessible to that which might pass through them, and tough enough to withstand the rejection expressed in word, deed, and limited compensation that might be short-term or might last a lifetime. They need to collect, cultivate a true independence of mind so they can weather the opinions of others who may have a less sophisticated or less daring sensibility. Even those who have gained great prominence for breaking ground in their fields may actually resist the innovation of others and surprisingly stay wedded to the status quo, and therefore, out of fear, jealousy, or insecurity, reject the new. All of these situations and the underlying tests of judgment and values they embody need to be communicated to the next generation of creative practitioners so that they understand fully that the reception for their innovation, if negative, should not be devastating. Since these judgments will be dependent on the historical and sociological situation of the moment in which their work is being evaluated, they need to be able to distinguish this type of rejection from that which comes because the work is simply not complete or reconciled with itself. Nevertheless, it is both the new and the rethinking of the old that comprise the terrain they must explore, no matter the consequence. Temporalities, part two. Artists and designers as travelers. Artists have often lived cosmopolitan lives, even without much money, they have found a way to travel, propelled by a longing to see the great works of multiple civilizations 
that they have read about in art history. Within the world of educating artists and designers, there has always been a great value placed upon viewing significant works in situ. One cannot adequately imagine painting and sculpture, building and monuments from reproductions, and contextualization is crucial to experience what Walter Benjamin has referred to as aura. Many artists and designers also have felt a kinship with other practitioners across cultures, finding in the work of other civilizations similar goals, methodologies, and often an even more innovative visual acuity. This has propelled them to spend time within other societies. But now the urgency to understand how art and artists, design and designers, fit into multiple societies has become even more essential. If young artists and designers are to be useful to this historical time, they need to understand their own society and its complexities, but they also need to comprehend a much broader global context of society, where they fit within it, what they might be able to add to it, and then learn how they can move fluidly within multiple realities. Young practitioners need to be prepared for the contemporary world they are entering, a world moving so quickly where at best East and West, North and South converge and merge, where cultures intersect and learn from each other, and at worst, where cultures collide, endangering the existence of all species and the well-being of the planet itself. And the complexity of cultural integrity, cultural hybridization, and cultural interaction that young artists and their professors must now consider. Complexity, densification, needs to be a core value embedded in the educational process. It is no longer enough to know one society. Artists must understand multiple contexts. Most of us do not want the world to become flattened out or oversimplified, and there is a fear that globalization could come to mean homogenization. Many creative people find this idea terrifying and take inspiration from the places where the cultural terrain is thick and rich, which pulls them into societies other than their own. Young practitioners must embrace this complexity so that they are unafraid of the world's diversification and not immobilized by its social problems. While acknowledging the world's vastness, they still need to reproduce its specificities effectively. I have always believed that the capacity to navigate this type of cultural layering and not be daunted by it is best achieved by travel. Young artists benefit from moving through different temporalities and forms of production. How else can any of us imagine the concept of the global citizen and make it concrete if we don't attempt to experience the world's complexity directly? Writings about post-colonialism in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, while helping us all to understand the relationships of dominance and submission that were inherent in cultural structures and thought, have also made some creative practitioners too self-conscious to interact with these societies, as if exploitation must be an unavoidable outcome. Educators need to open students' hearts as well as their minds to ensure that they are not immobilized by theory. I say it again, immobilized by theory. <laughs> Essential as a starting point to understand the historical dynamics of how colonialism and its aftermaths have functioned. Have functioned. Such theory, however, should not be intimidating or inhibiting. It should help to provide intellectual order to the oft-times chaos of a worldly experience, but it should never take the place of that experience. Artists and designers, many of whom are agile in their ability to admire and absorb complexity, visual and other, can become adept travelers and navigators of the contact zone, the place where diverse cultures intersect and are often able to transform what could be a barrier into a point of entry. Contact, contact zone is a term introduced into linguistic theory by Mary Pratt to designate social spaces where disparate cultures meet, clash, and grapple with each other, often in highly asymmetrical relationships of domination and subordination like colonialism. Where some may be resistant to difference or intimidated by the weight of history and its associated guilt and sense of responsibility, artists and designers as professional producers of visual material, but also as viewers, the audience for the visual, are often inspired by cultural originality or specificity to make their own work. Whereas social scientists feel the need to represent the entirety and complexity of societies to acknowledge cultural relativism before they are able to evaluate and respond to different societies, artists and designers, having done their own type of research and interrogation, 
often very focused and organized around their own interests, are adept at trusting a personalized experience of place and then acting on it. Their enthusiasm for visual and performative traditions, their intuition about what might work as a creative response to a particular context, their ability when captivated to sit still, listen, assimilate, and transform can allow them to move within other social settings very effectively. Artists who have given these issues a great deal of thought and are willing to spend time within societies other than their own can create a free zone of hybridization, a place where multiple forms of cultural dispersion can coexist. They bring to these interactions either a consistency of media through which they have always worked, sculpture, photography, performance, film, painting, or a consistency of, tech, of methodology, a way of working that is historically aligned to these projects. Through this consistency of, pra of practice, they feel confident enough to take on the project and to locate themselves in its otherness. Finding something in the outside world that corresponds to a location in their interior world is no small matter, but it is remarkable that even young artists are able to do this, as I have experienced with students traveling in Southeast Asia and in Africa. For the last years, I've been involved in a project called The Quiet in the Land in Laos, begun by curator Franz Morin. This project is Morin's third venture outside the traditional Western art world structures. In this instance, as in the others, she has immersed herself in the particular part of the world where the project would take place, preparing the terrain, in this case of Luang, Luang Prabang, Laos, over several years for the project before introducing it to artists and before bringing a very carefully selected group of artists to Luang Prabang, which is a World Heritage Site and home of hundreds of Buddhist monks who come to study in this, the center of Buddhism for Laos. As she has done in other situations with the Shaker community in Maine and students and writers in Brazil, she brought artists into this com complex community and facilitated their time in these locations so they were able to create work and within these settings, within these settings. For this project, some very interesting and accomplished artists from various parts of the world spent months in Luang Prabang and during that time found personal ways of connecting with the place and its extended communities. Photographer Alan Sakula, for example, researched his project by exploring the villages around Luang Prabang. He broke his leg while moving between these villages when he tripped over hidden sections of barbed wire overgrown with plants, but he returned to the village after this calamity, which involved being air evacuated to Bangkok for surgery to have his legs set, and he completed his documentary, which begins in a blacksmithing village across the Mekong from Luang Prabang that still produces its own metal tools and utensils. The film focuses on the village, but also on the materials used to fashion these objects, some of which are made from old shell casings left after the devastating tonnage dropped in Laos by the US onto the plain of jars and other sites during the secret war, the war in, uh, in Laos. Sakula found a connection in this village through his own familial history. His grandfather had been a blacksmith and through his own anti-war activism. And his film reconstructs a good deal about the effect of US intervention in Southeast Asia in general and Laos in particular. Artist Janine Antoni sat in the Lao Hmong market for weeks at a time attempting to learn the stitches the Hmong women used to make their unique embroidered designs of clothing, bedding, and objects. It was her way of connecting with these women and hence of the place. After establishing a rapport, she collaborated with two Hmong women. She told them, she told them the story of the scars on her body and they told her their life histories and thus a personal exchange was made. She traced the scars on her body and then reproduced the marks and the stitches on the fabric and then she asked her father, a former surgeon, to sew as he had sewn her incision after operating on her many years before. For another piece, she traced her family's complex transmigration through DNA analysis. This is another Hmong piece, sort of out of sequence here. Um, through DNA analysis and represented this mapping pictorially using the medium of embroidery, a way of working that has personal meaning for Antoni since it is a form her grandmother in Trinidad had perfected. The Hmong women also embroidered elaborate depictions of their life stories, narratives of their upbringings, marriages, children, the war, and the tragedies. 
Their pieces and Antonis were then exhibited together. Artist Nithakong Somsanith, also a participant in the Quiet in the Land project, is a master of the gro of gold thread embroidery techniques that he learned from his aunts who had created sacred stitched objects for the Lao royal family. After years of exile in Paris, he now returned to Luang Prabang to work with the Quiet in the Land in collaboration with Vietnamese artist Din Kiu Le, and together they created culturally hybrid pieces. Samsonit used the same stitches he had learned as part of his royal upbringing, and with the conceptual assistance of artist Din Kiu Le, whose family came to the United States from Vietnam when he was 10 years old, created contemporary images of Luang Prabang, beautifully embroidered houses on stilts with enormous satellite dishes on their roofs luxuriously represented in gold thread. Like Nith, Din Kiu Le had returned to his point of origin. He now lives in Ho Chi Minh City, where he works with contemporary artists, runs a gallery space, and continues to show his own work in Vietnam and in biennials and museums around the world. Artist Anne Hamilton, that's Anne on, that's Anne, it's Franz Morin. Artist Anne Hamilton, whose hybrid practice uses landscape architecture, design, installation, and other methods while working closely with the Buddhist Sangha and with Lao architects, designed an elongated meditation boat for the monks to use as a place of retreat. An escape from the encroachment of tourists into the small village centered around Buddhist rituals. The concept was based on these unique one-person walking meditation structures traditional to the Mekong region. Hamilton's boat, so these are the walking meditation structures, very narrow, but you can come through and do a turn, one person. That was the image that Anne had in her mind when she began to create this. Hamilton's boat was, by ble was blessed by some of the top abbots and first launched in Luang Prabang during our group visit in 2006 and again in 2007 for a second blessing. In the, pro in the presence of nine monks and nine novices, as well as artists and other supporters of the project, the boat was launched, and the boat was gifted to the Buddhist Sangha by the Quiet in the Land Project, which also raised the funds to maintain it for the next five years. So these are some of the images of the monks. So this was a collaborative endeavor between Anne, the Buddhist Sangha, and the Quiet in the Land. You can see the land. I'll leave that one up, it's so nice. As, as complex as the situation of entering societies not your own may be, and as complex as the notion of cultural hybridization is, these artists inspired creations and adaptations of traditional motifs function as transmitters of cultural integration. I should say that the book of The Quiet in the Land, for which I'm writing a piece and many others have written, will be out next year, and it, you'll see there are really 14 projects, I'm just naming very few, and they're pretty amazing projects. These hybrid projects can be read in Luang Prabang, but also potentially in Rio de Janeiro, in London, in Johannesburg, in Chicago, in Montreal, in New York, all locations where hybridity is understood. The work can communicate in multiple settings because it makes the connection between disparate places and different times, disparate times through artistic production while acknowledging and moving beyond pastiche appropriation, the analytic, and the ironic. Artists and designers are able to work successfully in places like Luang Prabang that are labor intensive in part because they so admire what local artisans, craftspeople, architects, and builders make. They are interested in forms of expression where form follows function and function follows form. And in most instances, they are very respectful of the talent of the artists and artisans they encounter. In general, artists are not obsessed with the distinctions between art and popular culture or with notions of high and low art and design. I always think these are critical evaluations. While critics employ categorizations such as these, those who create the work can appreciate the subtleties and solutions presented by many types of practice, objects and actions equally unencumbered by a need to reify them into silos of definition. In societies like Laos, where haptic production still exists, artists find inspiration from the respect accorded the handmade, objects for everyday use, but also those intended for religious rituals. In Luang Prabang, where Buddhism plays such a prominent role, artists and designers can appreciate the abundance of iconography because they too 
live in a world of the metaphoric and the symbolic and are often intrigued by objects of religious significance whether, whether they themselves are observant or not. They understand that these objects have accrued psychic value, an iconic value, and that these images are often powerful as a result of this and also because they have been fashioned by the best Lao artists. They also understand the hybrid nature of these objects, many of which have been influenced by multiple, multiple sources, including contemporary motifs and techniques from the West. Because many contemporary artists still make things by hand, those living in societies that exist within exchange-based modes of production can appreciate the pieces artists from cultures outside their own fabricate, just because they are also handmade. Even if the images are other to them, the art making is still usually rooted in one person's vision and is therefore quite intimate and does more than just reflect the anonymity of mass production accomplished for consumption. Rather, there is a recognizable, identifiable, imaginative source for and meaning to the project with whom they can identify. And perhaps most significantly, many Western and non-Western artists are comfortable living and working in the simultaneities of time, culture, and diversities of scale that one may find in such a situation. At some, as some artists have grasped, traditional societies may be less technologically equipped to deal with 21st century modes of production, but might be better prepared to understand its present complexities, both spiritually and aesthetically, since they are used to negotiating multiple cultures, languages, and religious influences. Luang Prabang is particularly interesting since it has been, since it has seen many forms of colonialism, including that of the French and the American, and has retained its Buddhist traditions in spite of its present communist regime. Where might the respect for the handmade, the made, the personal, and the collective lead creative people? It would seem to direct them to a place where what many now regard as retro may point to the future, a way to proceed artistically outside the gigantic morass of market economy to something more intimate and local but still global and significant, something of the self but also of the world, something applicable to both a society governed by advanced capitalism an exchange-based economy. There is an element of preservation in all these concerns, but preservation not just of the built environment, but also of tradition. There is an underlying fear that not only will life on this planet change considerably if we do not become more vigilant about how we produce products and conserve our resources, but that the diversity of the world's cultures and the range of their unique production will become eclipsed, universalized, and homogenized if it is not treasured. Sustainable, unsustainable practices. It makes sense that in the last decade, the worlds of architecture, design, and art making have helped take the lead on what is now the very fashionable practice of sustainability. Although connected to the ecology movement of the 60s and 70s, this new iteration, which has taken form around issues of global warming and sustainable living and design, has become the movement of the next generation of creative practitioners. As a concept, it has also thrived in the academy. This seemingly obvious and sensible idea is actually a very radical one. It goes straight to the contradiction at the heart of US society and promises to have a profoundly positive effect on the future of civilization if we as humans can act on it soon enough to redeem or at least to stop the further destruction of the environment from human folly. It requires long-term thinking and planning, which in itself is quite unusual in many capitalist societies. It will only be achieved when people begin to think about the issues collectively. When I was dean of the School of the Art Institute in Chicago, the school was closely involved with the city's project of sustainability. Chicago was one of the first cities to turn the roof of its city hall into a garden, which is what you're looking at. Completed in 2001, it made a strong public statement about the mayor's commitment to sustainable practices. Since that time, a number of roof gardens have been created, including Millennium Park, probably the largest garden of its kind in the world. The park covers two enormous city parking facilities. At the School of the Art Institute, we invented a curriculum called the Green Zone, designed to capture the undergraduate imagination as it relates to these issues and to allow students to work on projects specific to the city, their immediate environment. As part of this curriculum, students working with faculty redesigned the signage for the Chicago River, offering a practical guide while presenting the river's history 
in a visually engaging form. They imagined new systems for recycling and created prototypes for green roof buses, all in collaboration with city officials who were helping to determine which projects might be useful to the city while critiquing their development along the way. These projects have enabled stu students to see the city as a location they can impact directly, thereby pushing the notion of sustainability from the abstract to the concrete. But the implications of sustainability can go even farther into the heart of a society like that of the US than these project-oriented interventions. If we take the concept of sustainability even deeper, we have to confront the most unsustainable, pra unsustainable practice in which humans engage, and that is war. Measuring the impact of war based on the concept of sustainability makes logical sense, since war is a strategy that destroys and wastes resources, human and other, in the name of speed and efficiency on an unimaginable scale that affects generations. Architects, designers, and artists as a group generally oppose war and beg for other solutions to conflict. Creative practitioners recognize in a situation like the looted museums of Iraq, the destruction of an important segment of art and historical history. Once gone, these images of human conscious and unconscious aspirations can never be reclaimed. Like the human organism itself, which artists for centuries have represented in painting and in sculpture. The loss of even one person, one body, is the loss of a unique entity, an original construction that can never be duplicated and as such is irreplaceable. But when all else fails and pleas for peace are no longer heard, artists, designers, and architects traditionally have made serious work about what will be lost in war, what has been lost to war, among the endless number of paintings about war and destruction, the most celebrated is Picasso's Guernica. Perhaps what is so significant about the effect of Picasso's image is that in the West, at least, it has come to stand for both the destruction of humanity by the irrationalities of war and the age-old longing for peace. Just a small fragment of this epic painting triggers response, and one can see leaflets pasted on walls all over the world that use just a bit of this imagery to remind us of the horrors of war and ask us to stop its seeming inevitability. Lest we forget how powerful art can be, an image moved from a young artist's response to the fascist decimation of the small back town of Guernica during the Spanish Civil War to become a representation for the universal catastrophe of war and its consequences across civilizations for decades. During the Vietnam War, U.S. artists Leon Golub and Nancy Sparrow created many canvases that became emblematic of the horror many artists felt in relationship to the irrationality of that conflict. They leapt into the ca catastrophe of that war, its ugliness and duplicity, and spent their lives focused on these and other difficult issues. These are, as you know, are Leon's and these Nancy's. We also see contemporary artists who have become obsessed with the imagery of this present day conflict. Susanna Coffey, for example, has produced a body of work that I call, she calls now the war paintings, imagery taken directly from journalistic photographs of the war these paintings, like the Guernica, over time could become iconic representations of both the nightmare of war and the desire for peace. They are haunting and apocalyptic, as if the world is being destroyed and she, the artist, who continues to place herself in the center of the nightmare, is the only witness left to record the end of life as we have known it. But this response does not stop artists from working in this way, and it will not stop history from noting this work when the smoke has literally settled and humans ask each other these questions. What was produced of consequence during this time? What significant body of work captures the devastation of those years? What were the acts of protest, acts of conscience? Where were the designers, artists, and thinkers? What were they saying about it while it was happening? Donald Sultan, maker of gorgeous singular images, often very decorative and from nature, also has responded to the war with some magnificent and very dark images of displaced persons wandering 
along desert hillsides, blown up trucks resting in rubble, beautifully executed in poignant responses to photojournalistic images from Iraq. When creative people recognize that these anti-war gestures cannot stop the, destruct the destruction, some of them assume a different set of roles in the society. They are often asked to help create the icons that allow society to grieve its own catastrophes. When we inevitably forget and do it all again, artists, designers, and architects build the monuments that commemorate the profundity of loss. Maya Lin was a 21-year-old architecture student at Yale when she sketched a design for a war memorial, the likes of which had never been built before in, the, in America. Its non-representational tribute to all who had lost their lives has become the site of pilgrimage for the generations of Americans suffering the pain of the Vietnam War, those who went to war and those who grieve the loss of those who did not return. It may be the most successful war memorial in history. As a young designer, she had the foresight to build something integral to the landscape and stripped of all heroic artifacts, qualities which allowed people to see themselves reflected in the polished marble surface and to grieve unabashedly. The memorial is composed not as an unchanging monument, but as a moving composition to be understood as we move into and out of it. The passage itself is gradual, the descent to the origin slow. But it is at the origin that the meaning of this memorial is to be fully understood. At the intersection of these walls, on the right side at the wall's top, is carved the date of the first death. It is followed by the names of those who have died in the war in chronological order. It is up to each individual to resolve or come to terms with this loss, for death is in the end a personal and private matter. And the area contained within this memorial is a quiet place meant for personal reflection and private reckoning. Another artist helping the collective to mourn is Ernesto Pujol who began a series of walks in 2004 designed as sites of mourning and repair. They began as solo walks in cemeteries of fallen Civil War soldiers and are now epic productions using many student artists and others to participate in durational walks lasting as long as 12 hours. Performers are instructed to move as in walking meditation and then to contemplate loss and mourning. In the most recent walks, the performers grieved silently and publicly for the fallen soldiers and civilians in Iraq, while the audience did the same. These projects are of great interest to young artists because of Pujol's daring willingness to take on political issues in such a personal way within the public arena. Fearlessness. The US has been in a desperate situation, and thus, more than ever, has been in need of those who are fearless, not afraid to say what they see. Preach the truth to the face of falsehood, wrote Herman Melville in the 19th century. We might say it again now at this moment because we have heard too many lies. Deception can do to a nation what it often has done to individuals, cause a deep corruption of the soul. Because artists and designers are rarely given worldly power in the US, not in the US at least, or tempted and therefore compromised by such possibilities, they often can live and work under the radar, as Guillermo Gomez Pena says, of the strategies of performance artists. Because as radical and transformative as their work can be, only rarely does a society actually sense its true power. Mostly it is hidden, and ironically, therefore, art is free to say what needs to be said. In art at its freest, we recognize its true potential to show us how to love the great things of this life, to abhor their destruction, to imagine what does not as yet exist, and to refuse intimidation and the encroachment of personal liberties. These are the best values fostered in the education offered in schools and departments of art and design. These are the values many young artists and designers would do well to internalize and take with them into the world and from which they could define the purpose of their creative work and lives. If utopia itself is a site, albeit a non-place, not place, an impossible place, then it is the site where such hopes originate and continue to live. 
Most people, it has been said, live in the past, clinging to old ideas, to the familiar. Artists, architects, and designers, we are told, have the capacity to live in the future, dreaming it into being. But perhaps artists, designers, and architects actually live in the present with their hyper-awareness of what exists around them intact, always aware of the pain of the past, but also able to see the opportunities, potentialities, and threats for into the future. So perhaps they don't live in the future, but rather in the now, aware of the simultaneities of time and the relationship between cause and effect, seen in an instant and captured for eternity. Can schools of art and design, with all the best intentions, channel this potentiality and make the prospect of social engagement exciting enough to compete with the versions of glamour and success presented by the art world apparatus to its constituencies? This is surely a, worldly, a worthy challenge. If young artists and designers want to use their skills and talents to penetrate the joys and conflicts of society in whatever forms they choose, then the work of educators will be complete they will have successfully secured that the most creative people of the next generation will be on a path to what I consider success, the ability to live a creative life, making work in the most elegant, poetic, imaginative ways possible while participating in democracy as engaged and engaging citizens, committed to challenging its premises and advocating change whenever and wherever possible. Thank you. So, we could take questions. I know it's a lot of stuff, so it's hard to ask questions, but you might have one. How is it framed currently after last week? Well, I think I would talk about, I mean, I would, it would be inevitable, you need this, it would be inevitable um, that one would talk about the amazing possibility of, m of moving consciousness at such a grand scale that was unimaginable to us in the last eight years. That, that phenomenon, that slow grassroots movement of consciousness um, was something that although I, I always thought I always, always thought Barack would win, always. But I never imagined the degree to which the win would, I never thought it would be as, as large. So I, I think that when I think about each person, each person in the country who voted for him had to go through a sequence of understandings. And for some people that was very complex. And we read a lot of articles about that. You know, people had to overcome what they thought of not, he didn't know he was, I mean, I was living in Chicago, we knew who, we knew him, but people in New York, when I first came to New York, really didn't know him. There was that, there was race, which was enormous, there was youth, there was all these, all these things that were, you know, obstacles, obstacles, obstacles. So each person had to understand that over time that they were looking at the future, that they were seeing in him the future. So I think that what has energized people so amazingly around the world is that plus the notion of democracy, which is an incremental consciousness by consciousness coming to an awareness. I think that that, that could happen after eight annihilating years of the, you know, really an attempt to make people so stupid and so dumb and so constricted into such a small part of themselves that we all were really got quite numb that everybody could be re-energized, to me is so enormous. And I, so I think one has to talk about that and say, well, you know, really look at how did that happen and how ready people were. And part of the reason that I'm interested in like images that have become so historically important is that I think we all forget people who make images, I write, but people who make images forget the potential of the power of images to solidify consciousness at a given moment, you know? So I don't exactly know what I would write differently, but I know that I, it, one would have to come at it with that optimism that comes out of something like we've just witnessed. That's my feeling about it. I don't know other people may have a different sense, but you couldn't write, I, I, think, we, I think what's gonna happen for everybody is having to think about what will you do now, you know? 
Like it's a different, we, we are overnight in a new world, I think. And I think that that will change peop how people feel about being in this country. Um, so what, what is the response to that? Because what creative people do is they respond to the historical moment. So what will be the response to that? I don't think we've all figured that out yet. Does everybody hear the question? Yeah. I think the question is, um, you know, I talked about it in relation to Vietnam, I think the same problem in a way, which is there are things about the society of the United States, U.S. society that we as a, as a collectivity have not ever really faced. And, and, and I think you're asking like that it's been unimagined, we can't, I think we, we have, I know that there are things, I think two things I always think that are sort of unspeakable in America, although they're written about endlessly, but in some very deep and immediate way, we, don't, we can't talk about them. One is slavery, and one is the annihilation of Native Americans. I think those are two, you know, two basic things upon which the country was built that is very, very difficult for people to talk about. It's so painful. And um, I think, for me, Vietnam is another one of those things where we can't really say what we did there, you know, um, because it's, but, but individuals, and I've written, you know, I've written about this in my, a piece about me lie, individuals have suffered the same way that African Americans have suffered, the consequence of that, but the unspeakability of it is part of the suffering and part of what makes, you know, it's like with the individual, if you repress an enormous part of your own history, eventually it will come back and get you. And the form in which it got America was the race, racism of America. So that's why this moment is so fascinating. When 70% of the population say, well, race wasn't a criteria for the vote, something's happened. Um, but I think we, if you look at, you know, ontogeny and phylogeny, and you look at the individual as the, um, many, many of us walk around, most of us, all of us, with repressed parts of ourselves that we can't really look at or that are so painful. And I think that societies do that and, and pay for it because in Freud's notion of repression, it's like a block in the way and everything has to go around it. You just pretend it's not there like a big rock in the river and then the water has to reroute around it and that's how we develop our consciousness, you know, he would say, this, these moments of repression. And, and I think societies have those boulders in the flow of things too that keep them from moving forward. So I don't know. I mean, I don't know the answer to, you know, how do we imagine what we can't imagine? Um, I think in little increments as much as we can let it in. But I think, I think that's why people, I think, yeah, my experience of watching everything going on with the election, watching students and younger people is there was this elation. But in people my age and older, there were a lot of tears. And I, I think that the tears come from having watched Martin Luther King be assassinated, Malcolm X be assassinated, all the Panthers be, you know, there's this backlog of pain about race in America that it's hard to forget. So when something like this happens, it's very cathartic, I think. And it doesn't really answer it, but, you know, I think artists have to think about all these kinds of things. How do you talk about what you can't talk about? You know, and when do you do it? And like I said, sometimes you do it, nobody wants to hear it. You know, we should do it anyway and you know, hope that somewhere down the road somebody might want to hear it. Anybody else? Oh, wait, good. We have a mic. 
encouraging um, artists to um, is the mic on? Is it on? <laughs> Continue cur encouraging artists to um, like kind of all of the things that you talked about being important in terms of um, the things that are artists are thinking um, thinking about like asking honest questions and and um, even if that is in opposition to um, you know, like you looked at Van Gogh or something who, who, who people didn't see his paintings or buy them, you know, but he kind of kept that vision going. And I guess one of my kind of thoughts is that we live in this moment where, um, I mean, because of maybe communications and maybe because of, of, of um, the advancement of, of ideas even in art schools, like there's so many artists working um, maybe trying to hold on to ideas that you're talking about being important that aren't going to be manifested in the art world or, or be, have um, societal or economic value. But I guess I'm curious what you think, where you think places are for those ideas to be exchanged because I feel like to work, to keep those ideas going with yourself or even with a small circle of, of, of peers or like-minded, you know, just keeping this kind of idea that, well, this work is important, you know. How do you do that? Yeah, like where, because that that is like, I think continually as I go along, like I realize that's the essential other side of the, of the of, I mean, for, for some reason just making the work in the studio, it's not that it's not enough, but that reception and that dialogue on the other side of it is essential. And if you're not part of a more gallery or whatever dialogue, like where do you see, those dialogues happening? You know, I, I, I think about it a lot because I never wrote things that fit anywhere, really. You know, like they didn't fit in the really academic journals and they didn't fit in the mainstream because <laughs> there were too many ideas compressed and they, they, were, they were kind of part memoir, part, you know, everything I write is kind of a little wacky in that it doesn't, it doesn't fit organically simply anywhere. So that's why they go into books mostly. Like it's almost like you have to create the form for it. And writing is easier in some ways because it's so it, reproducible. It's a multiple, you know, and you can make more of them and you can even publish them yourself and you can give them out. But I, I think that um, most of us make work for those closest to us, those that we, you know, who do we really want? in our real heart, who do we really, really want to like the work? The people who we truly admire. But we want the work to get out, we all do, but we also have to come to terms with the fact that sometimes that's really hard to do, and sometimes we're very thwarted, and sometimes things happen later, like you do something in it much later, and that's why I was trying to talk about that. It needs to be talked about in pedagogical environments that, that this is a, can be a very lonely proposition, but that doesn't, you have to, I think one has to redefine a notion of success and that we maybe don't offer our students a large enough notion of success, that we, we measure it, we wait for the world to give it to us and, and acknowledge us when in fact that might not happen as we want it to and yet the work could be amazing and that's why you know, I gave several examples of that kind of thing where things that are so, so obviously we know are so important and significant have been historically and yet we're so rejected at the time. So I think one has to carefully create around oneself a universe of people with whom one is actually in conversation all the time, whether or not, you know, and we were talking about the Brooklyn Rail earlier, you know, the Rail is the most, it's such an interesting publication. You know, I was saying who else cr reviews a book that's 20 years old, you know, <laughs> except the Brooklyn Rail, and who mixes uh, literature and poetry and nonfiction and politics and all of it up in one. So you have to look for those venues and if they don't exist, maybe ha one has to create them. But the really hard thing is holding on to your own sense of purpose within all that, I think. How does one hold on? That's really the question. And I think we're very privileged, all of us, because we live in these environments, these pedagogical environments that understand creativity and really value it almost more than anything else. But even within the systems we operate in, there's a star system that everyone wants to be part of and it's very seductive and very few people get that um, and may not get it as they hope. So I, I don't have an answer for that other than I always say to students that they should leave in groups. They should meet 
groups of friends in art school, <laughs> you know, and meet writers. And meet, if you're a visual artist, meet the people who write about art. Meet the critics. Um, the critics should meet the artists. The curators need to. Everybody needs to meet each other because they're, this, these institutions are little microcosms of the world that, that everyone's going out into. But it's so much better to go out as a team than it is to go out alone. And we've seen that increasingly with collectives, you know, young people forming collective groups and, you know, moving. I mean, Chicago is infamous for everybody moving to New York or something. You know, it doesn't always work and sustain itself, but it is a way of thinking about motion um, and finding those people that intellectually. You know, sometimes people write. You know, they read something I write and they send me an email, and I always write back because I feel good they're uh, uh, they're in my kin group or something. You know, they're somebody that under is interested in the kind of strange way I'm putting something together that I always acknowledge that because I understand that that's lonely if you're out somewhere or not in a Mecca where you might have a, a lot of choice of people. Um, so it's not really an answer other than I think we create our universe around us and that gives us a kind of courage to, go, to keep do, pursuing it. But the most important thing and the thing you have to keep internalizing is the pursuit of these serious questions is the work. You know, that is the work and that is the purpose and whether the world acknowledges it at a given moment or doesn't, that's still the work that you have been given to do. I mean, maybe that sounds terribly Buddhist, but it is how I think about it, you know. to see a new era of social activism. And very tellingly, it was done in an art gallery. And I'm not sure what the ideology of that was, but I thought it's really interesting that that was the environment that that came from. And I'm thinking about the trajectory of your talk, and you start off with, you know, looking at artist and play, and you're not very much talking about social, you know, artists and social engagement and social activism. And I'm wondering if, if you think that we may be on this a verge of time when, you know, artists and activism, you know, the people who are artists and people who are activists, that that distance might be very much condensed. That I think, you know, that the, the idea of artists being separated in, in many ways, and especially in the, you know, the last eight years where you know, withdrawal in some ways seemed like the best um, response to something which was really very oppressive. That's, that's a really interesting question because what, I, what I'm talking about in this whole thing of artists and travel and such is this idea that artists are very well equipped to deal with the global world, sometimes better than any other group of people, just in the nature of embracing, the, of embracing difference, the interest in, in what is other. You know, if I wear something like a bracelet or something from Cambodia or something, you know, an artist will immediately say, where's that from? Where'd you get that? That's, you know, there's an, it's, an, it's a cultivated sophistication. I started really with the visual, you know, the sophistication of the, I never know what I've actually done. So it's interesting you said, you started with this. And I don't think that way about, you know, I just sort of do it. But like you do, every we all do our thing, we don't really know. But um, that, that maybe that we're living in, a moment of visuality so highly developed that all of the people who are involved in that visual, in the, in the development of their own visual sophistication already have an advantage to deal with that complexity and that people are interested in the complexity of otherness and difference and that people are not, that artists are often not afraid to leap into a situation. Like I said, I mean, I've been in many situations where of technologically unadvanced societies with makers who have a direct way to connect to that society, whereas social scientists, or even me, writing a piece like this, I don't have a direct way to respond. I come back, I write books, I think about it, but I watched Janine learning to embroider in the market, and I was with her. You know, she's making a connection because she's interested in how do you do that. I'm interested, I wanna learn that skill so I think that artists are in a really interesting position just at that whole level of globalization and the complexity of that, but also of maybe of a kind of way of structuring community that artists are quite good at and creating of alternative space, you know, and that the art world allows for the multiplicity of disciplines to come together. Like even in the university, now that I'm in a big major university, I'm, I'm very surprised. I didn't knew it intellectually, but I'm, learning it again, the, the divisions of things. Whereas in art schools, everything comes together. And people are interested in ideas. It's like ideas are the currency. So whether they're manifesting in photography or they're manifesting in art history, or they're, it's the idea that becomes important. So it could be that 
these places and the way that people are being educated and the problem solving nature of it and is already somewhat connected to a kind of activism of putting things in the world. But it's an interesting thing. We'll, we'll, we'll get to look back on it. And, uh... All right, wait, let them give you the mic so people can hear. One is that the visual and the musical art that exists in those two spheres, I mean, this is an obvious um, observation, but I have to make it, they're non-linguistic. So if you're relating to someone as a maker, there is the, the co-making, but visuality means you can communicate through the eyes, which doesn't have the linguistic division that many other disciplines uh, depend upon for articulate communication or communication at a deep level. Um, and there was one more thing I just forgot. Um, so oh, you th the, the, what is activism? Uh. That the word activism um, is, uh, you know, how what is received as activism is is maybe the case, not what is intended as activism. I think most, much, many or most artists, one could say, place themselves within the um, story of activism, wanting to make change or looking at their environment and seeing something that should be different or so on and so forth. But it's, it's interesting because I had a fight with my publisher about the new book because it's called Thinking in Place, Art Action and Cultural Production. And they wanted it to be art activism and cultural production. And I said activism has, is a particular word of a particular moment. But the word action is something that artists can relate to because action can have many forms. It's an activism locates itself with a, a certain goal, whereas action can be ambiguous. Maybe that's what Susanna was trying to say. And I wanted that word because I want it, because the book, because I write often for the visual art world, and I wanted artists to relate to it and not think that if they weren't activists in the traditional sort of 60s notion of an activist, that somehow they were excluded from it. Because I consider art, and, the, and that's what I was trying to say, and the making of art and painting as a site of action. What is the content of that action is what I'm always trying to understand, and what is the effect of that action, but I see it as action, and as I see it as a place where action can happen, but I don't have one form in which I think that can take place. So activism, to me, located it as one form of action, and I wanted that ambiguity. I won, finally, basically. I said I won't put activism because it dates it to me in my mind. I'm thinking of something else, although with Barack's and community organizing <laughs> and children saying they now want to be community organizers, who knows, you know? I have a new generation of people who want to talk about activism. Anybody else? Yes. Um, it seems like we've talked about uh, a lot about what artists want to do and whether people want to listen to them or not, but what if you're not an artist? So um, people that don't make art, how do they fit into the part of the dialogue? Well, I, I listed about 25 professions in most of my paragraphs. I, think, I thought it was annoying, but I wanted it not to exclude people. I think it depends on what one does. It's the way one thinks about one does, what one does that's significant. You know, I'm a dean. You know, I'm not an artist. I'm a dean and I'm a writer. Um, but I think about what I do, both those identities, as one, as a kind of action form of action. So I think it depends on what what you're doing. What are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> in advertising. Okay, so wait, you're right in my first paragraph. So the question is in general. I think where it what what the piece this piece is about is about values. So what are the values that you want to have embedded in your action? I think that's a question that everybody can ask themselves about everything we do, you know? That's, what I, that's why I say being a dean or being a writer to me, they're not that different. They're just different forms of action. But in each I try to, there's certain values I'm interested in. I'm interested in building cultural institutions. I'm interested in writing books. But whatever one is doing, you have to decide within what you're doing what are the values that are meaningful for you? What is the action that your life is embodying 
you know, and what is your version of success? It's, we all have to ask ourselves those questions, not take on the, the apparatus of the culture, but individually define that. And then, after you've done that, figure out where you fit within the larger society. So I think, I mean, I'm interested in action. I just happen to the here be talking about a particular form of it, but I'm interested in how do we manifest ideas, you know? So that includes almost everybody. I, I know, you know, sometimes I, I had a cousin who was a very big business person, and the thing that amazed me about him and his friends was I couldn't find any content in what they did. It could, when we, they talked to me about their work, there was no content. To me, making money is not content. It's a manifestation, it's a, it's a result of a certain series of actions, but what is the content that leads you to the making of money, I think is a real serious question. <laughs> How you, what you do and the consequences of what you do. So, the, so I guess what I'm saying is that everything that I'm talking about, I hope, I hope is, is um, uh, applicable to everybody's life. And also I hope that people live their lives creatively, whatever it is you choose to do, which is that you value play, you allow yourself to fail, you know, all the things I've been talking about, um, and that you are able to put yourself in history in some conceptual way to see your life as significant and in some way in a historical context. So I hope that, I hope it answers it. Should we stop? Is that it? Do you want to? Thank you all very much.